Elegant, splendiferous, extravaganza. Okay, you got ready? Ready, Miss Elegant, how are you? Jim, you can't even imagine. I wish you were here. I was just telling Steve downstairs, he wants me to call him Steve. I just telling Steve downstairs um, with the double sessions of running in the girling up G-string lingerie double, morning and night, I, I took off the extra few pounds. Let me stand sideways. You can't even believe how thin, how tapered, how narrow, narrow, narrow the girl's body is. It's beyond belief. I changed the hair, though. I have all the hair on one side. The girly, gorgeous locks, the lion's mane to one side, to one side. You have to see the ass and the legs. It's, it's unreal. 71 years of age, looking like 41. It's not to be believed. Now, here's the girl walk. They don't teach you this. They don't teach you this in college. Here's the regular swing girls walk. Wow. The swing girls walk. Oh, holy, oh, my goodness gracious. I have the whole city with an erection. The whole Manhattan is with an erection. All right. Now, Jim, um, thanks for being. So you're the, you're the new um, person that used to be. What was the other guy's name, uh, Steve? What was Gerard, the guy Gerard, Gerard, Jerry Gerard. So you're going to be the new Jerry Gerard, right? I mean, I don't, I, I can never take Ger, Jerry Gerard's place, but we're going to try our best. It's an honor to even be uh, interviewing you and talking with you first. Well, th th thank you, Jim. And by the way, today, I promised Steve, he wants me to call him Steve, that um, we're going to do a touch on some items here, some, some topics that never in my long, illustrious Radio career with Stein. I know you like the way I say it. Stein, as in Howard Stein. Ron and Ron. Ron Bennington and Ron Diaz. The Ron and Ron show out of Florida, in Tampa, Florida. Steve Kane, a very big hitter radio show I was with in Florida. Um, Jewish and Christian broadcast network. And with all the shows, I never, never went to where I'm going right now. And you'll be amazed, too. I'm going to just touch on this. And by the way... This has to do with some very personal family matters. And um, Jim, I wouldn't go there. But you see, 20 years ago, at 2001, Stein and Horseface Delabate, they brought a fake child of mine onto the show with an attempt to discredit me, Miss Elegant, and to um, defame Miss Elegant. And... Stern made a, a, made a proclamation, an enunciation, an announcement that he wanted to do a DNA test to prove that she was right and I was wrong. I said that girl was never my child. There was no link, no connection, no association, never. Stern, Stein, Stein, Stein backed out of the deal because he knew the DNA would come back in my favor. He said he would pay for it. He never did it, never paid for it. There was no DNA. She was never my daughter. It was fakery. It was a, it was a, it was a complete fakery and mockery. Okay. Now, before I go where I'm going, one of the best and most memorable shows I've ever did with Howard Stein, Stein, is when I told the world I was not wearing this. I was wearing um, a red sequence dress that Stein said, you look great. You look great in that dress. I wore that dress in the Las Vegas show when they did the um, that uh, that quiz show in Las Vegas, and that show when I was in his um, studio and I was wearing the sequence dress, I said to the world, "I put Stern in the coffin and I buried him. I buried him. I buried Howard Stern. I put him in the coffin. I put him in the coffin. I buried him. I buried him. I buried him. I buried Howard Stern. I buried him. I put him in the coffin and I." Buried him! I buried Howard Stein! That was one of the most memorable shows. I you ever. left him for dead. You left him for dead. I left Stein him. for dead. That's right, Jim. That's the words. You so, okay, so now, so 20 years later, so the girl came on, tried to discredit me. Stein knew it was a hoax. He brought fakery, mockery. He brought a decoy into the office. He wouldn't pay for the DNA. He wouldn't back up his words. Now it's my time 
Miss Elegance turn 20 years later. Would you imagine this? So the girl said all these horrible things when I did and I did. So let's start off with this. The girls, the, the wife that I married, and again, they opened up the Pandora's box, right? They spoke about the things I did, bad things. My girlfriend, Nina Ronnie Moss, my next wife, she was my girlfriend, she was my life, I was living in sin with her, oh, I abused her, all this, okay. So, on, let's start from the beginning, from Jump Street, from Abinitio, A-B-I-N-I-T-I-O, Abinitio, A-B-I-N-I-T-I-O, and from the beginning, Jump Street, ground floor, from the word go. So I met, I met... This beef stew, as my father, Sam Offen, called her and called, called their family. I met these group of beef stews. Anna Biscotti, B-I-S-C-A-R-D-I, in a subterranean restaurant called when Wendy, Wednesdays in Germantown, on 86th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenue on Friday evening, July 31st, 1970. I was married to her on December 28th, 1970. At the time, I was living at 6188 Dry Harbor Road in Middle Village, apartment 3G, and she was living in the ghettos, in the slums, in the worst part of the world. Only the scum of the scum would ever live there, 493 Liberty Avenue in East New York. That's where she was living, with mice and rats running up the pole of their house in the upper room, in the upper bedroom, where she used to bring me to visit. 493 Liberty Avenue, East New York. It's all things. You know, just like when I said I busted Joe Cross and Steve, go back to the records of the stage delicatessen and prove me right. When I took out a gun and I was going to mow down all the Cubanos, 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 Cubanos at the Hialeah Flea Market, Main Road, and I was almost pinched by the Hialeah Police Department for a 9 millimeter burner deli. These things happened, happened. Just as sure, just as sure, just as sure, well, just as sure as. The adrenal glands sit on top of the kidneys. The thyroid gland is right by the trachea. And the parathyroid glands, the four parathyroid glands are embedded, embedded, embedded into the thyroid gland. It's a physiological certainty, all those things, right? The three that I just right. enumerated. Right. With that same kind of accuracy and certainty, that's how sure it is that I busted Corson's teeth. That I pulled out the nine millimeter Bernadelli at the high Ilya flea market, was ready to pull the trigger on nine Cubanos who were ready to attack me and jump me. In self defense, I was ready to mow them down. So, with that same degree of certainty, all those figures I just, all those details I gave you 493 Liberty Avenue, I live 6188 Dry Harbor Road, Middle Village, with my family, that was where her family was. Okay. Then I treated this, this, um, this beef stew, this empty pocket, this rusty nail girl. Anna Biscotti, I treated her royally. I mean, you know, she had spit. She was working at the time for Bob Freeman. Bob Freeman at the White Weld Corp. Company. White Weld in the Colgate Palmala Building. Colgate Palmala Building. It's still there. 49th and Park Avenue, Manhattan. The company was White Weld. Her boss was Bob Freeman. She was making 80 in 1970. The girl grew up with spit. She had nothing, never had a penny. The family never had a penny. The father was an immigrant an immigrant construction worker. They came from zero, nothing. So she leached and latched on to Miss Elegant, and she only wanted to, like, she only wanted to live like a queen, a queen, right? So she made these demands on Ike, and she knew I had all this money. Impossible. So she only have shoes, shoes. From I. Miller, I. Miller, the best girl women's shoe store in the world, 57th, more, uh, 50, southwest corner, 57th and 5th Avenue. She used to bust me out, take me there, 10, 12 pairs of shoes. At that time, it was a lot of money, $200 a pair, platform open toe shoes. Take me to Martha's dress shop, Martha, 58th and Park Avenue. For anybody who knows anything about women's clothing, the dresses. 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 a copy. Today, that would be like 10,000 per dress. Okay. Um, she would take me on tours to Dallas and Houston, Texas for Neiman Marcus shopping. Shopping. Neiman Marcus. Her fur coats had to come from Ben Kahn. Ben Kahn. Anybody who's anybody, anybody who's anything knows 
Ben Khan, the biggest, most lavish, exclusive furrier in the world at that time. Ben Khan on Fifth Avenue. So $10,000, stable $10,000 ranch mate. Okay. Um, so now, her dresses, though, they had to be only, the, only from Chloe, from Halston, from Bill Blass, from Jeffrey Bean. Wow. What a wardrobe. Wow. $100,000 wardrobe, then all the diamonds. Oh, my goodness. Um, uh, Van Cleef and Arpel, Tiffany, all of the joints. Okay. So she had me coming and going with money. And she was a thief. She used to empty out my safe deposit box for ten, twenty thousand dollars. I was always short, and I never knew. I said, "Where?" She always denied. She was a thief and a chronological, pathological, neurological, psychopathic liar. Okay. Now, in addition to all of what I just said, so I, as I told Stein, I never had any intimate sexual relationship with her, with her because with all of this. She was a Victorian square, and I'm Miss Erotic. I'm Miss Exotic. I'm Miss Funky. I'm Miss Kinky. I'm Miss Raunchy when it came to sex, especially back in those days, probably still now, but I control it. I hold it in. So, in any <laughs> event, so the bottom line was that I didn't, I never put my penis, as I told Stein, into her vagina. It never happened. It never happened. Okay. Can I just. Can I, I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, but can, no, I, go ahead, Jim. can I make a, a thought on that? And, yeah. you know, you also brought up a lot of questionable evidence, you know, you said about the birth defect and the paperwork and it, it, it's just a shady situation. So I'm on your side all the way on that. Well, thank you, Jim. So, all right. So now, um, somebody had asked, um, I, um, in the last year or so, I have to go back to get the exact date if you want. What was the most memorable? One of the, what was the most memorable experience, negative or positive, I ever had with Anna Biscotti? And I just told you the most memorable experience I had with Stein, as I went, you know, I went high volume and high crescendo. I buried him. I buried him. I put Stein. I buried him. I buried. I buried Howard Stern. I put him in a box. And then Jim, you commented. I left him for dead. Thank you. So the you most did, memorable. You did. You did. You told him. You told him what was up, and you told him something that not anybody has ever said to him. You told exactly. him the truth. You and told him to look within himself. You punched the wall, which actually brings me into a quick question. You always were carrying keys, and I'm not sure if you still carry keys around. But on the on the uh, your your fan page, someone wanted to know. You seem to carry several dozen keys on key rings with you, often clenched in your fist. What yes, and to this very, you're right, Jim. That's very observant, and thank you for asking. And to this very day, not when I'm here right now, when I'm running or outside, every single day, every single run, it's the same exact key ring for some 30-plus years. And the reason for it, thank you for noticing, yes, I do have my, put them on my finger. There's a double reason for it. Many of those king keys are the safe deposit boxes, with precious documents, and I never want to jeopardize, especially when I'm running with panties and stockings and brassiere, it's of ever losing these keys. So I attach them onto my finger, they're there. They can never come off. Okay, the other reason is, it's all like, you know, the keys, they're so sharp and so heavy, so if I ever have to bang, 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 if I ever have to bury somebody, who's trying to, like, attack me, I have the metal to bloody them up at the same time. That's, that's old school. That's old school. That's an old school yeah. trick. So the metal, uh, key, give somebody the metal keys on my knuckles will bloody them up. Yep, yep. Not just bash them up, but bloody them up. But thanks for asking. Okay. So one of, the most, one of the most memorable situations, if not the most memorable, in the nine and a half years that I was tortured with Anna Biscotti, and her and her duplicity and her lies and thievery and, and cheating and all that is this is a classic. This is coming up, Jim. You're not expecting this, Steve. You're not expecting this. On New Year's Day, January 1st, 1978, we were living in our second of two Glen Oaks apartments 
These were garden apartments. The first one, when I got married to her, after December 28th, 1970, that's the date on the, the marriage license, we lived at 252-33 72nd Avenue in Glen Oaks. 252-33 72nd Avenue, across the street from the public school, right off Little Neck Parkway. So anybody who knows about Queens will know that area easy. Then on, in 1978, on January 1st, we were living in our second of two uh, Glen Oaks apartments. In between that, um, and that was nine and a half years, we lived at 104-20 Queens Boulevard, apartment 12B in the in the exclusive Parker Tower, Parker Towers on Queens Boulevard in Forest Hills. At that time, that was an elite area. It was like Midtown East back then, way back then. Now it's like the scum of the earth area. Okay, so in any, in any event, so on January 1st, New Year's Day, um, you see, this girl, Anna, like every day, um, by the way, she was never Anna. After the first year of our marriage, she was noodles. Check this out. Get her on, get her on the show here. I, but somebody told me she just recently croaked. She's not alive anymore. But by the way, her, um, her parents, I was told just recently, somebody came up, Domenico Biscotti and Michelina Biscotti, they passed away just recently. How did um, you get the name Noodles? Um, I gave her the name Noodles. It was my name. I'll explain to you why she was Noodles. She was never Anna after the second year of marriage. Noodles Biscotti. So on January 1... 1978, my wonderful mama, may she rest in peace, Marilyn Adele Gordon Saxon, her maiden name often originally, divorced Gordon. So she was Marilyn, my, my, my natural, wonderful, precious mama, may she rest in peace, was in our second Glen Oaks apartment. This is a classic of all. And Noodles, from the second year of our marriage, was disrespecting I on a daily basis. And here's the disrespect. Every time I would say something that she didn't enjoy, get out of here, get out of here. That was her classic. I heard this in my ears for like eight years. It wouldn't come out, get out of here. If I said something that was not pleasing to her, get out of here. Instead of saying, you know, something, well, not right now, or we'll think about, get out of here, get out of here, bring her on the show, let's confirm everything. So I just about had enough of the get out of here for eight years. And I just took it uh, to a different level. So we were all, at that time, we were, um, and by the way, um, the baby was born already. Not that baby. The real baby was born. The real baby was in the apartment, too. And my mama, Marilyn, and Noodles, and myself, were in the bedroom, we're talking, and she gave one of those, get out of here, in front of my mom. So check this out. And what I'm about to tell you right now, about to tell you right now, it's just as sure, right? Wow, this is some as the superior and the inferior vena cava are bringing deoxygenated blood into the right atrium of the heart to a physiological certainty, this is to the letter, to a T, T-E-E, -E, to a T, the way it went off. Okay, so I said to Noodles, no, without any violence, without any vulgar language, I said to Noodles in front of my mom, take off your blouse and brassiere, and I called her Anna, and for like the first time since the first year of her marriage, I did not call the news. I said, Anna, take off your blouse near Brazil. And she looked at me. I said, you heard what I said. And that's the way I'm talking to her. Just in that kind of, Anna, take off your blouse and your Brazil. And I'm pointing to her. And she did so. I walked down. Make me, this, is, this is exactly what this is. She's standing here. when I'm over here. And so I walked over to her. And I cupped her bust. So her busts were like pinpoints. Beautiful, um, beautiful. As a, matter, as a matter of fact, it was my wonderful mama, may she rest in peace, who despised Anna because of the way she was railroading me and taking advantage of me and stealing all the money. 
So my wonderful mama gave her the name, those name of her bus pinpoints. So I cut her pinpoints and I said to her like that, bang, bang. I slapped the left bus twice. And I said to her, do you know why I just spanked and slapped your bare butt? Because you're never going to say, get out of here ever again, are you? And I said, you're going to tell me you're never going to say. So she says, no, I'm never going to. Bang, bang, bang. So, okay. Each bust was slapped in series of twos, five times ten and ten. Bear on each one. Each bust was blistering red. She didn't cry. Tears were coming down her face. You know, I have this phenomenal memory for every detail. Way back even before Joe Corson, tears were coming down. Now, we don't know if the tears were coming down because her bust was so red and sore on both sides or because of the double embarrassment and humiliation because not double, not only to have her bust bare, slapped and spanked in that kind of with that kind of severity, but my mama, my wonderful mama, was present to the whole thing. That's a crazy situation right there. Okay, I gotta say now, a very crazy situation. Well now hold on. We didn't finish it. When I'm done with it, right? I said to Anna. Biscotti, noodles, but I, I was still calling her Anna and for that particular session. And I said to her, after the 10 and 10 on each pair bust, now, you're never going to say get out of here again, because if you do, the next time, I'm going to slap and spank you right between your legs on your bare vagina. That's what's going to happen next. Right? Okay. And I never had to spank her vagina or slap her bare vagina because she never did it again. After the, after the lesson that she learned from her bare butt being slapped and spanked a total of 20 times, she never again for the duration of the marriage. Now, the marriage ended, and I never saw her again, as we have it on my video after April 3rd of 1979, I never saw her ever again. But from January 1st of 1978, on New Year's Day, when her bust bare, slapped, spanked 20 times, 10, we're on certain sets of twos, and each time she had to repeat, I will never say, get out of here again. She never said, get out of here again, so I never had a slap her between her legs on her bare vagina. Now, now, just, just as sure as the kidneys lie position retroperitinally, retroperitinally in the lumbar region of the back on each side of the vertebrae, that's as sure as it is to a physiological certainty that every I said, without one smidgen, without one sliver, without one shred of exaggeration, amplification, or magnification, that's the way it went down on January 1st, and even to the last letter, with the war the warning that I gave for what would happen to her vagina if she ever said, get out of here again. That was the classic of all the classics. Interesting story. Interesting story. All right. So... Now, before, before, before you come in, before you just say one thing, let me just add one thing um, to something different. So, Jim, there's an existing situation. That was like a billion years ago. There's an existing situation um, going on at 419 East 77th Street. That's the synagogue. Um, that's the Kabad Labavitch Synagogue. Very, that's an interesting situation. And... Um, at this moment, uh, Steve, what time is it? It's, right it's 5.30. Now, it is 5.30. 5.30. We have 30 minutes. Great. So, uh, Jim, I'm not going to go into too many details at this time, but I was severely disrespected 
And the, so, but I'm not going to go into it or address it now or discuss the future or, or anything. I'm just going to kind of give everybody a little taste and tease. So, um, you know, just, and then we'll, we'll pick it up at a different time. Um, so the leader of the organization, and by the way, I have some very treasured friends at Kabad, like Rabbi Shalom D. Lipskar, L-I-P-S-K-A-R, 9540 Collins Avenue, the Shul, the Shul, the Shul, the Shul, in Bal Harbor, Florida, where they just had that tragedy close by, you know, with the building collapse. Horrible. Um, so um, actually, he's not in Bal Harbor, he's in Surfside, just very close to where that building collapsed. Um, so he, Rabbi Lipsgaard, dear friend, special friend, and many other people. So this is not in any way, in any way, God forbid, God forbid, God forbid to diminish or defame or say anything negative against my people, my Jewish people, never. But let me just tell you this, Jim. Um, this is a matter, you know, between now and the end of time. In any organization in the world, whether it's Judaism, Christianity, Catholicism, the police department, the fire department, the judges, the lawyers, accountants, doctors, surgeons, brain surgeons, nobody not one organization between now and the end of time has everybody that has everybody on their ship that's 100% ethical, righteous, kosher. Never in any in any walk of life, never. So although we have in our Jewish faith, we have like in the high 90s of all moral, ethical, scrupulous people with values, virtues, morals, ethics, stability, loving, caring, God-fearing, honoring, loving people. Not everyone. Sorry, not everyone. And, you know, they step out of line um, way before. You know, I can't help it. Public public information. You, you um, Steve showed it on the video. On Eastern Parkway, 770 Kingston Avenue, um, they they made it. I didn't ask for it. It was in the it was in the New York Post, the Daily News, the New York Times. Um, vandals from there. They physically jumped me, put me in the hospital, attacked I, Miss Elegant. It was so bad that they they had to put a write up in this in three of the biggest publications in the country. That's a terrifying well, situation. I'm sorry you had to go through that. Yeah, and, and what? But yeah, and the question is why? They're trying to impose their will on another person, and even God, even God doesn't do that. He gives us free choice. So um, a way, a little way back, their leader makes a statement that he loves everybody, welcomes, welcome, 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 welcome. Come in, we love, we love, we care, we appreciate, we want everybody, a Jew, a Jew, a Jew, a Jew, a Jew. Then speaking from the other side of his mouth, he says that the following, if you're a man and you say you're a girl, you're breaking the Ten Commandments. You're not welcome here. You're not welcome. You're breaking the Ten Commandments. You're not welcome here. Now, again, first side of his mouth, we're all welcome. We love you all. Come, come, come. But if you say that you are a girl when you're a man, biologically you were born a man, you're not welcome. You're being exiled from the community, from our shul, our synagogue. And then he'll go on to say, the only way to live is in modesty, modesty, dress, modesty, mo imposing his will, telling people how to dress, telling people how to live. And then he'll defend himself by saying, you know, I'm getting inundated. This is the leader. So I'm getting inundated. People, mothers, mothers. 
from their second grade children are saying their children have to be sit down in the schools next to children that are potentially gay or potentially going to be homosexuals. And, and the mothers are complaining to him, to the rabbi, about the school system. So the leader, if he was really, right, God-fearing, God-honoring, God-caring, God-worshipping, God-devoting, God-loving, he would say to the mothers, you're all insane. Bring up your children the right way. Religious children sit with everybody else. Everybody is equal rights, equal protection of the First, Fourth, and Fourteenth Amendment. Equal protection, equal rights. We all sit together. We sit with blacks. We sit with Chinese. We sit with homosexuals. We sit with lesbians. We love all as long as everybody is respecting everybody else, not breaking any laws of society, and explaining to, 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 their, to these wild mothers that people can be good people, they can be honorable, decent, trustworthy, God-caring people, and they don't have to be heterosexual. They can be homosexual. They can be lesbians. They can be gay and still be fine, decent, upstanding, outstanding people in our community. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. And honestly, we're all human beings. We're all human beings. You know what I mean? And everybody should look at each other that way. There should be no... No prejudice whatsoever in any type of situation like that. And I'm sorry that you have to, you know, endure those now, types now, of things. Now, Jim, wait, 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 listen for the coup de grace now. So then, okay. So after this happened, so the next day, I come back and I make an announcement because I'm not going to tolerate this disrespect no, in my please. case. He's putting it right in my face. So I come back to the place, and I'm going to talk about my wonderful mama, and I'm going to talk about um, uh, health, and I'm also going to speak about – who's putting the – hold on a second. Jim, are you there with me? I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. And I'm going to also make my announcement that – I'm going to be a transsexual, a transgender for the rest of my life. I just want to put it on record. And to make sure that I wasn't mobbed, right, or attacked, I brought four of my, my gangsters with me for protection. Because I remember what happened at 770 Eastern Parkway. Um, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong spotlight here. Okay, thank you, Steve. So I remember what happened when I was mauled, maimed, and mugged and hospitalized at 770. So not for the purpose of anything, but just protecting my life and my body, I brought four of my, my, my regular gangsters with me. And they were off to the side just to make sure when I'm saying I'm a transsexual, the whole place didn't come up and attack me. Elegant. I'm going to segue into something very positive because unfortunately you had to deal with all those negative things and i apologize for that just you, can, I I just say, can i just can i just finish the thought and then you can absolutely. go right here absolutely you can do whatever you want thank you so all right all right so that was the end of that well then the following day i come back to do my prayers and check this out the leader is waiting for me by the front door with three of his henchmen, three of his henchmen. Now, this is a religious man, right? He's waiting with, so he comes up to me with two henchmen, and one henchman is waiting inside the door. You can see him, you know, through the glass of 419 East 77th Street. You got two on the ground, one at the door, I guess he hadn't needed these henchmen there. Maybe he thought that when he told me, he gave me a letter, like not to come back anymore. Maybe he thought like I was going to punch him in the mouth and break his teeth 
But of course I wasn't going to do nothing like that. But he was so scared, he had to have like his henchmen there. When I brought my gangsters there, you know, I was facing, I was there with 100 people. I don't know who these 100 people are. I didn't know what was going to happen. But when I came there, it was just, he could have just been one-on-one -on -one with me and told me what he wanted. But he wasn't sure of what was going to happen or my reaction. So we had three of his henchmen surrounding him. Okay, so all I did was tell him, okay, we'll, we'll figure it out on a later date. Okay. Well, no, wait, this is the ending. This is good. Figure it out at a later date. I take this information to two sets of gangsters. I take this to my set of gangsters in Brooklyn and my other set of gangsters in lower Manhattan. I just told them what happened. Now, this is, a, this is amazing. The way gangsters' minds, the way they think. And they say, both sets, not connected. They don't know each other. They're not related. And both said almost verbatim. One said, you want us to take their eye sockets out? And the other one said, this sounds like an eye socket job. Eye <laughs> 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 socket. So I said, no. I walked away from them both. Um. I don't think they were talking about eye socket job or eye socket from the the leader. I think they were talking about the eye socket job for these three henchmen because the henchmen, obviously, if I try, Jim, and again, I'm expounding for another minute. At that day, if I tried to like say, well, I don't care about what you're saying. I'm going into the synagogue to pray anyway. Those three henchmen would have, like, you know, laid me out, right? They would have ganged up on me, punched me, hit me, kicked me, bit me, do all those things. That's why they were there, to make sure. And if I tried to get through, I would, it would have been the end. Also, it was so fortunate, we can say, in a manner of speaking, thank God, that because most of the time when I went there and I go there to pray, my gangsters are always near me, but they're outside waiting for me in their black car for me to get through. Now, could you imagine, Mr. Short, that day when the three henchmen were there, I was just happened to go there without the gangsters. What if my gangsters happened to be in the black car right there? There would be no more henchmen. They'd, They'd be beef stews. They'd be done. They'd be bunkered. They'd be bunkered. They would have disfigured. They would have been this. All the, the leader's henchmen, who they, he thought were henchmen, they would have been dismembered. They would have been dismantled. They would have been disfigured. They would be there would be no identification left of them. The, the, the leader is saying the mothers are right. If they don't want their children to sit next to homosexual children, segregation, isolation. This is, this is insanity. Wait, this is schizoid. This is demented deranged, depraved ideology concept. We we love each other, yes, regardless, homosexual, blacks, white, Chinese, old, young, middle-aged, everybody cares, we get along with each other, we regard each other, we respect each other, we like each other. This couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't this agree guy more. is teaching us um, a way of hatred Hatred to anybody who doesn't have his philosophy. Right, I have exciting news that I, that's why I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I really do have some exciting news. Now, when Girardi interviewed you last time, we confirmed that you had fans on six of the seven continents of the world, which is insane and, and very, very flattering. But we can now confirm that you have fans from seven of the seven continents of the world. We have confirmation in a video made by a fan, and we're going to bring that up. Well, thank you. Wow! Wow! So, I'm, I'm excited right, to see ahead. this. Elegante, how are you this morning, big fella? Guess what? This is Dr. Michael Yeses Jr., and I'm broadcasting from the continent of Antarctica. Finally got a signal, and I watched Grillo's Aftershock, and I want to let you know that you now have fans in all seven continents. Wow! 
I, I, you know, he did the jingling with the keys. Yeah, we were talking about that. That's why we all got together and, and made that happen. Because he, he, he's a genuine fan of yours. The only thing he has to correct, if you can send him a text or an email, not big fella, big girl. That's what I said. That's <laughs> what I said. I said she is not going to like that. And one more thing since I have your full attention. I actually myself made a list of all your sayings and insults that you've ever made from the Stern Show, the Stein Show, up until now. And if you don't mind, I'm going to read them to you. Yes, but also, Jim, there's one other thing I want you to read. Um, I was honored by Steve Grillo that Stern's number one man, Stern's number one man, it's, it's on all of the um, uh, uh, billboards or post-its, that was Stern's number one man, Steve Grillo, Aftershock XL. And by the way, everybody join in. It's a fantastic buy, fantastic bargain. Spend your money right. Get in with Grillo, Aftershock XL. And Steve gave me this fantastic letter. Now, one thing, is right for sure, well, one thing is for sure, I may not see eye to eye with Steve on every single issue. I'm not, you know, he's not my stooge and I'm not his stooge. I'm not his yes girl and he's not my yes man. So, but I do believe for sure Steve is a person of honor. And for no money in the world would he write something that he doesn't believe. And Steve Grillo, Stein, Stein, Howard Stein's number one man, wrote the following. Jim, would you be kind enough, word by word, to read clearly and loudly what Steve Grillo wrote from <coughs> to Miss Elegant? I will read it right now. It's right in front of me. Let me just take a little sip of water here. All right. And as follows, and I quote, the Aftershock XL Network, written by Steve Grillo, and the following. The Aftershock XL Network is honored to have had the iconic international superstar, Miss Elegant, famous for her time on the Howard Stern Show as part of our platform and network. Her show is one of the top performing shows for not, uh, I'm sorry, six straight months of airing. Six straight months. She has been performing with the network since 2019 and has earned money from all of these appear appearances, including merchandise, sales, and fan events. I have one of your mugs, actually, so I, I know that's true. From her in informative medical knowledge to her dazzling dance moves and strong bond to her Jewish religion, Miss Elegant entertains fans from around the globe. She tantalizes her audience on every show, and people cannot get enough of her. It is enough to take it, it is tough to even take your eyes off of her. Miss Elegant continues to take the world by storm by living her lavish lifestyle in her Upper East Side New York City apartment. Her daily runs through the neighborhood has her fans in awe, and people will try to chase her down for photographs and autographs, which is very much true. I've seen I've seen many videos of people trying to get your autograph. Of course. Um, Miss, Miss Elegant is an asset to have, a, to have as a part of any show anywhere, no matter the subject being discussed. Ratings are through the roof anytime she is present. Sincerely, Steve Grillo, formerly of the Howard Stern Show. Well, uh, Jimmy did a fabulous job. Fantastic. Fantabulous job of reading that word for word. Thank you. And now if you would favor us and favor I, Miss Elegant, with your list of, you said... <laughs> My insults and compliments go right ahead, Jim. It's all Thank yours. you so much for, for, for letting me do that. All sure. right, here we are. So I have the following. This is from the Stern Show, and this is from now. These are things that you've said. I love them all equally. Uh, you've called people beef stews, misfits, nobodies, recall rejects, androids, undertakers, rusty nails, has-beens, deadbeats, <laughs> mongoloids, bunko artists, mental cripples, riffraffs, Lestertillian lugaroos, horse-faced hermaphrodites, <laughs> Troglodytes, bedlamites, yellow dogs, white leg horns, enema bags, brain dead, brain deficient, brain defective, arthritic, <laughs> epididymis, melanoma, mesothelioma, <laughs> epileptic, plantar fasciitis victims, cut faces like he like he told Robin Quivers, cut faces, crop dusters, crumb bums, fallopian tubeless, lymphoma, carcinoma victims, and dehydrated, epileptic diabetics. Wow. <laughs> Jim, that was fantastic. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I did put some time into that one. Thank you. And do you know, uh, you, you, every single one, I've used those, um, each and every one of those words or sayings and phrases and terminologies constantly. Um, 
and the way you put it together, I, listen, I don't make anybody, I don't give anybody any false compliments or try to make you happy or, or make you feel good, put a smile on your face. I don't do business that way. That was excellent. You did a, a an excellent so job for Miss Elegance. Terrific, Jim. Thank you. Well, that's, a, that's an honor. It's an honor. And we, we do we do have a few so, some questions, if you don't mind. I don't mean to digress, but I, I promised everybody I would close with some questions. Uh, we'll try to get through maybe one as if, if fast as we could. Um, Jim, don't just go <laughs> to one. Get we, know, we, know that, we know that you're an impeccable shape you're in you're in the best shape of your life and you're a health food person you're into diet and exercise but what are your thoughts on richard simmons and do you feel his diet and exercise advice are of good quality and good sound uh advice do you think that do you think he's he knows what he's talking about or so the answer to the question is um here it is in in the capsule form the capsule summation of that is i have never really looked into the Richard Simmons diet. So I don't want to make any negative response to Richard Simmons or his diet. I don't know what it really consists of. I never looked into it. I was never that interested to look into it because I have my own way for, for 38 years of doing things and my way is proven to be right beyond that by, by beyond everybody's. Um, I will say this, and no, no disrespect intended. Usually when you say no disrespect intended, you, 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 you're beginning to start to disrespect somebody. Not in this case. I don't particularly like the physical condition that I see of Richard Simmons. Now, maybe I'm not seeing him right because the angle on the television screen or, um, you know, I'm, I'm saying it the way it is. Maybe it's the picture coming in. I just don't see... A person like, you know, when you saw MJ on the basketball court, you saw a person like, you know, wow, yeah. this is a long, a long drink of water. This guy is iron. This yeah, you don't, you don't think that when you see Richard Simmons. You don't think that. Exactly. You don't see that. I don't see that. When you see, when you see Miss Elegant, you see a body of, of muscle and, 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 and structure, symmetry, curvet, curvaceous, curvature. Curvaceous, curvaceous, curvature. Keeping the world at a standstill. Abdomens, legs, thighs, anterior deltoids, the whole works. Gorgeous hair, skin. But again, as you just said, Jim, I don't see that when I look at Richard Simmons. So I, you know, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. But I've never, I've never looked into or subscribed to his diet. I can't, I can't say anything negative because I don't really know what it's about. Good answer. Good answer. Okay, next one. When the world famous stage delicatessen, where you knocked out Joe Corson, you left him for dead, you knocked him out, he lost his teeth, seventy five hundred dimes, you guys squashed it. But my question is not about the fight; it's about the food. What's your favorite meal from the stage delicatessen that you've ever had? Well, in, in those days, um, I didn't really, you know, when I was there that night with Joe, uh, with um, Sam Offen my father, and Joseph Offen, my uncle, and Accio, my fake cousin, because he really wasn't Joseph Offen's real son. Um, so the four of us were there. Um, I wasn't eating. And just like, by the way, um, it just uh, it reminded me of something. I, I was at Kabad before this um, disturbance happened. I've been with Kabad and that leader um, for over 30 years. And I want to mention uh, on a fast note, I'm sorry to I'm sorry to digress. I have never eaten, eaten, E-A-T-E-N, one morsel of food, not one morsel from their kiddish. You know, every after Shabbos they make a big kiddish. Never one speck of food. Everybody that's ever been there can vouch, verify, substantiate, corroborate, authenticate. So um, I never really indulged. My father, if you ask me, 
Um, he loved their, their corned beef and their tongue and their roast beef and their pastrami and their lake sturgeon and their tomato and their sandwiches that were 12 inches wide. I never got into any of that stuff. Um, I was always there more as, as the witness. I was there because my family was there. So that's really the way it happened. Okay, great. And and actually, one last final question, since it looks like we got six minutes here. Um, would you, this is a great question from a handsome Matt Morano, who actually did a show with you once. He wants to know, would you ever sign off on a documentary or a documentary series about your life? Because you, you've had such an outstanding and interesting life that I think people would love to see a film about you. Would that be something you'd ever be interested in? Well, Jim... Um, Break it down, break it down into simplicity. You're saying that somebody wants to do a documentary, or I want to do the documentary. No, no, I'm sorry. Maybe I miss. Maybe I miss. Maybe uh, you misunderstood. No, I'm saying so, somebody wanted to know in your own personal. Say, say in in a situation where somebody walked up to you and said, "Wow, you have such a fascinating life, and you're such an interesting person. We want to do a documentary about you." I'm saying in a, in that in that situation, if it was to happen, would you ever agree to that? Yes, Jim, but it would have it would have to be. It's a, it is a good question. By you said a Mr. Morano. Yes, Matt Morano, handsome Matt Morano. Okay, so yes, the answer is straight out yes, um, with the condition and the contingency and the proviso that it would have to you know be so much money involved you know for myself. And there would have to be so much upfront money. So meaning somebody could not come up to Miss Elegant and say, look, we're going to do a documentary and we're going to give you, um, hypothetically speaking, $25 million. And we're going to, and we know it's going to make $500 million because your life is over, beyond anything, beyond belief, beyond description, beyond definition. And everybody wants to hear the details, um, just like the details of Anna Biscotti, Noodles Biscotti right now that I unveiled. Um, Every day is a different adventure to this very moment, but they could not say to me, they'll give me $25 million on the tank, you know, with, with the carrot hanging out. So they would have to like give me multi, multi, multi millions um, to start and then pay me off down the road as the thing is reaching the, it's, it's reaching its apex, reaching Zenith, reaching Mars, reaching Jupiter. Okay, great, great. All right. Now, as we uh, as we wrap it up, um, I wanted to thank you personally for letting me talk to you and, and, and coming back. People have been eagerly waiting for your appearance, and this is a big, big thing for you, for, I mean, for Grillo's Aftershock XL. I want to thank Steve Grillo. I want to thank you. I want to thank everybody that's been a part of this, and I hope we see more of you soon. Yes, Jim, and, and my final note, do I have another minute, Doug? Um, no, yeah. Okay. My final note is, Jim, I'm thanking you and the crew um, again, sign up with Steve and Excel and Aftershock. It's fantastic. And I want to reiterate, renounce, re, re, <laughs> I want to reiterate and reinforce that anything that I said pertaining to 419 East 77th Street, I love, they're all my people. I love all of my people. I have the best people in the world. Not each one of them are following the laws of God. Not 100%. 90s, that's as good as you can get. But nobody, whether they're a Jew or a Goy or a Black or a Protestant, can ever flagrantly, egregiously, and flagitiously disrespect Miss Elegant and expect to get away with it. So that's where it's holding for now. We don't know what else is coming from it, but that's where it is for right now. And Jim, thank you very much for being part of the Miss Elegant Splendiferous Extravaganza. Right. Right. <laughs> Take care, Miss Elegant. Good seeing you. You too, Jim. All right, Miss Elegant, on a final closing note, saying so long to my fans. And also, uh, to share with the fans out there something rather interesting uh, in the coming time, in the coming shows uh, forthcoming, will be pertaining 
to my apartment, my beautiful apartment in Midtown East and Arthur Vernon. So this will be exciting information too, um, pertaining to where I'm currently at, um, at Midtown East on 55th Street and Arthur Vernon. Okay, look for, be, be salivating, pulsating and palpitating to hear about all of the upcoming um, unveilings that will be put forth from Miss Elegant. Bye-bye.